Ah. And here you are. I know you two feel the same. That this world is utterly meaningless. Sometimes, when you are lucky, you stumble upon a piece of art that found a way to meld so masterfully all its elements that one word comes to mind. Harmony. And Nier Automata is such an art piece, a production that takes its gameplay, animation, UI, music, writing, performances and just makes you feel that every fiber of what was created was done with a specific purpose in mind. Like thousands of notes played on hundreds of instruments, all pointing towards the same goal, sending the same message. A game with a soul so palpable that you can almost touch it. And the soul of Nier is a simple question. What does it mean to live a life without meaning? A question that apparently can only be answered by combining the existentialism of a 19th century French philosopher and a robot anime waifu. They say you shouldn't judge a book by its cover. Well, apparently you also shouldn't judge a game by its mini skirt because it feels to me like very few pieces of art tackle this fundamental question in such a unique way. A question I've been asking myself a lot during my life. Which is the same for most of us, I'm sure. But in the last two months, I've found myself looking at it in a different way. It turns out that my current health issues point to a disease called ME, which used to be called chronic fatigue syndrome. Chronic in the sense that it is for life. A sickness that makes it hard to do anything. Most of my time is now spent in bed. Everything I do makes my inner battery look like the one in an old iPhone that Apple wants you to change. So that question of living a life without meaning rushed in pretty fast and I was called back to this instant cult classic to work through my emotions. And as per usual on this channel, I wanted to invite you in to share the lessons and comforts that games can bring in times of hardships. How art helps us reflect on what we live. And no subject is more deserving of my limited energy than the optimistic nihilism of Nier Automata. Let's see how this tale of warbound androids ends up being one of the most comprehensive take on what it means to be human. I hope you enjoy. As a disclaimer, I will criminally reduce Nier's story to the core elements that will interest us, so my sincere apologies to Yoko Taro for this butchering of his masterpiece. Nier Automata starts off with a classic premise in the sci-fi genre. A long time ago, aliens tried to invade Earth. They had armies of robots ready to conquer the planet, so the humans decided to flee to the moon and let an army of androids, called Yora, fight for them instead. The war stagnated for thousands of years and we now embody Tubi, a battle android who is paired with Ninus, a scanner model, sent to Earth to investigate weird activities from the machine. The way Nier is written is based on a couple of very compelling twists that recontextualize the world and story in a deep way. This conveys well the general theme of Nier, which is the always changing perspective. This idea runs even through the gameplay that is ever shifting from a genre to another, going from a twin stick shooter to a hack and slash and passing by a 2D side scroller in a matter of seconds, all through the perspective of the camera. Taro uses those shifts in the narrative to put more and more pressure on the character to develop their motives, to question why they are fighting this war. Nier does so by separating its stories into three routes, A, B and C. A and B are following the same events, but from the point of view of both our protagonists, and Route C is the final lead that sees us playing the whole cast. So Route A is incited by our protagonist discovering that some machines present human-like behaviors. Like language, pacifism, tribalism, sexual endeavors, you name it. In a bold move, the first proper area of the game, after the tutorial, is populated by enemies that won't attack you. Already it feels off. You feel wrong for bringing them down even though you know them to be the army that forced the humans to live on the moon. This eventually culminates with the birth of the main antagonists of the game, Adam and Eve, two machines that evolve to look like humans and that beyond all seek to understand them and in a way, replace them. For the Superman's villains fans out there, uh, they kind of become brainiacs, but instead of seeking knowledge, they seek meaning. Chasing them eventually leads us to the first main twist. The aliens that came to conquer Earth have been dead for centuries. 
It explains the diversifying behaviors of the machines, each of them adjusting to the new reality in a different way, either by continuing their mission, even without those who formulated it, or by attempting to find meaning by mimicking humans. Which is, to me, and for the sake of this video, one of the most important ideas behind that story. The fact that in the face of meaninglessness, robots turn to humanity as an answer to this issue is the core of what we will be talking about. So keep it in mind. You go through Route A fighting incredible bosses and meeting new allies like Pascal, the leader of a pacifist village of robots that disconnected themselves from the network to live a peaceful life. You also defeat gigantic threats and end up killing Adam, who also disconnected himself from the network to experience mortality and individuality to deeply human traits. This leads us to the ending as Eve enters a vengeful rage which spreads to the other robots. In an epic showdown, you finally defeat him with Ninus hacking abilities. Due to a virus, Ninus gets infected and finally jumps bodies to get into the machine network to give us this beautiful final shot. And so Route 8 ends. And after the credits, you'll see a prompt inviting you to a sort of new game plus with several different storylines that change each time you play. Mentioning that it is recommended that you try it if you want to witness the full Nier Automata experience. If anybody stopped playing that game, at that point, they did not play Nier. Route B and C are what transformed this game from a competent and poignant proposition into a masterclass of game design and writing. In Route B, you begin by embodying a robot crying over his inanimate brother as he tries to heal him with oil, falling down as he attempts to bring back a bucket of it. This scene is all about the tragedy of innocence, it's the heartbreaking superposition of hope and reality, like a kid trying to cure cancer by giving a flower they picked up just in front of the hospital. You then zoom out to see Ninus watching him from afar, laughing to the absurdity of a robot calling another robot brother. We are now living the events of Route A but through the eyes of Ninus instead of 2B. And that first scene introduces us to the team of Route B, developing compassion for the machines. The second twist of Nier is the general basis of Route B. During your journey, you'll see new content, like what almost looks like a student short film built out of cardboards that plays out the story of the machines. You'll have access to the thoughts and backstories of enemies, the life and struggle of bosses, all of this contextualized by Ninus hacking ability. What was once only epic fights are now about machines struggling to find meaning in the world, each of them trying to find purpose in a different way each time bringing us a new perspective. We see glimpses of Simone, the bus encounter from the amusement park, how she fell in love with Jean-Paul, mimicking her real-life counterparts, which were a couple of philosophers, of Simone de Beauvoir and Jean-Paul Sartre. But she does it in a naive way, just trying to be more and more beautiful by assimilating her fellow machines, trying to impress someone who doesn't care. For her, the question is, what is a life without love? After the battle ends, you have a long text appearing on your screen, her deeper inner thoughts, all on that search for beauty, for acceptance, attention, love. And it goes on for like three minutes. For near shifts in perspectives come hand in hand narratively and aesthetically. Just like when you seamlessly change from a bullet hell to an action RPG, near Automata beautifully flows from different types of narrative styles. I can't think of many games that suddenly make you read what looks like a three minute robotic breakup journal entry as a narrative culmination to a fight. I love how bold it is and it shows the mark of a true artist. And we go through each encounter this way. You now see the story of the king of the forest. In Route A, all we understood was that a bunch of machines devoted themselves to a baby robot. In Route B, you understand that a group of machines, after the death of the aliens, decided to form a kingdom, attempting to imitate humanity. When the first king died, they decided to make his son king, as per tradition. They made king a baby robot they constructed. Robots don't grow, and so for many years they protected that baby in what we represented a kingdom, a family, a home. For them the question is, what is life without a home? What was a giant robot ready to destroy the encampment ended up being a lonely machine confined to the bottom of the sea as even the machine who created it feared it. For him, his question is, what is life if it's not shared? 
all these once menacing threats are now seen in the perspective of their pain. The void stared back, as would say Nietzsche, and it broke them. And we then reached a point where our protagonists were separated in Route A, this time from Ninus' perspective. After being killed, Ninus' consciousness reawakens in the bunker, the android space station orbiting around Earth from which they organize war efforts. Hacking his way through Yoros' file, Ninus finds strange and contradicting information. Confronting the commander with this, we learn what is the biggest twist of Nier Automata. The humans are dead. There is no one on the moon, nobody to claim her back if this war was ever to end. And worse than that, they died way before the aliens invaded. They died due to an illness, and androids had no master to serve, no reason to fight. And so those in command decided to create one. They hid the fact that humans were extinct, and saw the war against the aliens as an opportunity to create meaning for the androids. What's life if there's no one to fight for? This now echoes the first word spoken in the game, the introduction offered by To Be. Everything that lives is designed to end. We are perpetually trapped in a never-ending spiral of life and death. Is this a curse? Or some kind of punishment? I often think about the god who blessed us with this cryptic puzzle, and wonder if we'll ever have the chance to kill him. Machines and androids faced the same problems. They were created to be weapons that can pull the trigger alone, but then lost those who pointed the target. They both existed without reason. But there was a certain species that lived for thousands of years that dealt with this exact problem. And before we look at the ending, before we go through Route C, I want to explore that notion. In the face of meaninglessness, the machines decided to emulate humans. They sought to recreate their structure, the way they live together. Families, religions, kingdoms, villages. Like, for example, the religious group that overtook the factory. Machines turned into zealots, casting themselves into the fire so that they could join God through death, or become God. A surreal moment, a spectacular one that will probably stay with you long after the game ends. At first, it might seem like a moment of folly, something only a crazy mind could consider, a malfunction more than a proper decision. But the key to that moment is the fact that machines learned from humans through their history, and in no way was it possible for them to differentiate truth from fabrications. So as they went through the knowledge accumulated throughout the millenniums, there was no way for them to discern what was fiction and what was science. Truths and lies looked the same on paper, and machines ended up believing fabrications with the same certainty that makes us sure that gravity won't stop working tomorrow. So if that brings you to God, to heaven, why wouldn't you jump? And this is one of the greatest commentary about what it is to be human. The fact that we lie to ourselves. And not only do we lie, we are, for most of us, at least a little bit conscious of that lie we fabricate. The myths and values that comfort us, ideas that let us be okay with ourselves even though we know deep down that if we were to lose our faith in those fictions, this life of ours would be difficult to endure. We're talking about heaven, karma, justice, destiny, unconditional love, success, legacy. Every time we lie to ourselves, every time we put something on a pedestal, it is because we seek transcendence, something bigger than us. Something that makes us go beyond our ego, beyond just existing. Where some, like Nietzsche, embrace nihilism, the absence of meaning, as their view of the world, Sartre, our existentialist icon, embraced life's absurdity as its vision. Meaning does not exist initially, it's something we infuse. Meaning is a choice, an absurd one, but a choice still. A very human choice. And machines made that choice without understanding it was one. They couldn't solve meaninglessness because they lacked that one ability needed to make that decision for themselves. They can't lie. And so they needed to imitate humanity because it was the only way they could find meaning. Accept our weird little beliefs as pure truth without the weight of doubt. We have the luxury of hypocrisy, of living unfaithfully to the ideals that we say we pursue. That necessary hypocrisy is why we don't throw ourselves into lava 
It's how we end up despising a person we love deeply because they broke up with us. Why we are so generous when people watch but not so much without a witness. All of this is to endure life. Which brings us to the name To Be, our heroic android. Many of you have already understood the reference to one of the most famous sentences in theater history, to be or not to be. But for many of us, it's the whole thing we know, right? To be or not to be, that is the question. But have you ever heard the rest? Do you know what it's about? To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer, the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against the sea of troubles, by opposing and them. To be is to suffer, and every day we live, we choose to suffer. And in this absurd fight against the inevitable destiny, somewhere along the way, we find meaning. To be or not to be, to live or not to live. Finding meaning is a necessary act of defiance, Defiance against the truth, the fact that there is no meaning. We protect ourselves from nihilism. And now, with this upbeat analysis behind us, we can talk about Nier's ending. Route C is a glorious ending to a fantastic game. And we will skip through almost all of it to talk about the main points that matter to this video. The emotional foundation of Route C is the death of Tubi, which launches Ninus into an unrestrained rage fueled by hatred for the machines and for A2, a renegade android he blames for her death. An android which, by the way, you end up playing for most of that route. That rage leads you to an attempt at tearing down a newly formed tower which hosts the machine network's consciousness. You culminate that quest for annihilation at the top of the tower where you, the player, are faced with a choice in the final confrontation. Will you be Ninus? or A2. Which path do you want to see? Which vision do you want to follow? Both choices lead to a unique ending. The A2 one leaves us with a single quote. I never quite realized how beautiful this world is. For Ninus ending, he slowly dies in a fading text epilogue similar to Simone's story. Then there's a wonderful meta concept with the credits that I won't get into but that is pure genius. And finally, an epilogue where your drone companions talk and say this. Everything that lives is designed to end. They are perpetually trapped in a never-ending spiral of life and death. However, life is all about the struggle within this cycle. That is what we believe. This is what we believe. It's the lie they chose to find meaning. Pain is a certainty, and humanity's defining trait is how they deal with it. This notion transcends every cultural difference we have. It is life's unifying feature. And I think it's at the core of what we discuss on this channel, art. There's a quote in the movie Midnight in Paris that always stayed with me. The artist's job is not to succumb to despair, but to find an antidote for the emptiness of existence. And in front of such an arduous task, Yoko Taro shines an optimistic light on that question without shying away from the bleakness of the world. Nears doesn't tell you that everything's great, that these wonderful virtues and myths are gonna save you. Nier deconstructs any bigger meaning to bring you back to the smallest one possible. Connection. It's the love we feel, the care we harbor, the empathy we harness. There's no rational answer to the meaning of life, and so all there is is something beyond rationality. Or before, depending on how you geographically locate feelings and rationality. We don't choose love, we can't reflect our way past it. Life's enjoyments are not rational. We can rationally explain how they function, but not rationally feel them. Ninus love to be, in however way it can be described. And even after all other reasons to fight were stripped away, that's what kept him going. That's it. Nothing more. But certainly nothing less. And I think that's the most optimistic view we can have on a meaningless life. That we can feel something so fundamental that it overrides life's biggest question. That true transcendence does not come from any construction, 
but from connection. Even though we tend to seek more. Even though we often fall for our own lies. So two months ago, I learned that my health issues were uh, worse than we initially thought. I'll likely be handicapped for the rest of my life. This illness stripped away from me a lot more than I ever expected to lose. I can't work, can't perform, and it has shifted most of my perspectives on how to deal with life. A part of what gave life meaning is gone. A lot of what made me feel connected with other people has been taken away. And there's no lying to myself back into it. Not for this one. The days stuck in bed are long, and continuing making these videos has probably been a way to entertain one of the lies I still tell myself. That this random project I started just to be sure I wouldn't become cynical of our medium by working in the industry has now changed. Now I catch myself hoping for way more, hoping that I can reach someone, reach money, change something, even confined to a room, confined to a broken body, a broken brain. I've never met any of you, probably never will, and yet each time someone takes a moment to write something about my work, about how it makes you feel, or about the subject of my work, about how this game makes you feel, I connect. The simplest words make my day because they just remind me how much I enjoy sharing joys and pains, because somehow I find meaning in that, just by not being alone in it. Which is, I think, the whole point of Nier Automata. And I know almost nobody watches this, and even fewer care, and it's okay. But to those who do, thank you. These days, even more than before, I really cherish that weird, silly, and somewhat compelling connection. Love you all.